Honda wanted to beat Ferrari. This car can rev to 8,300 RPM, which is just insane. I can see why this car punches so far above its weight class, and that's because it just can outhandle pretty much everything, you know, from its time. Hi everyone, I'm Kenan from Cars and Bids, and today's video is a little bit self-indulgent. You see, recently on Cars and Bids, I sold my beloved 1995 Ferrari F355 with no reserve. And ever since then, everyone has been asking me, what am I going to get to replace it? And well, this is one of the cars I've been thinking about, the Acura NSX. And in today's video, we're going to discuss all of its facts and figures. We'll first begin by talking about where this car fits into Honda slash Acura's past. Then we'll get nerdy and discuss some of the technical details. And then we'll do what I really want to do and take it for a drive. And with that, let's get started. And the story of the NSX begins with curiosity. In the early 1980s, Honda let their engineers go wild, experimenting with different layouts for their cars to get away from their FF design or front engine, front wheel drive design. And one of the more interesting prototypes that came out of that experimental phase was a mid-engine version of the Honda City, which was kind of an economy car of the time. But this car actually drove very well, and Honda engineers and executives loved the feeling of having the engine mounted in the middle of the car. And so, when Honda decided to build its first supercar, they went with a mid-engine design. The design brief for this new supercar was an ambitious one. Honda wanted to beat Ferrari. They wanted a car that was faster and outhandled the equivalent Ferrari, which at the time was the 328. But vanquishing Ferrari wasn't something that was new to Honda, as they had been doing so on the racetrack as an engine supplier for Williams, and then later for McLaren, totaling six Formula One World Championships. So they weren't afraid to take on the mighty prancing horse, and they would do so with the NSX. But the Ferrari 328 wasn't the only car that Honda aimed to beat. They wanted to build the best sports car in the world, or at least the best to their capabilities. And so they evaluated the competition using the Milky Way diagram. Basically what this is, that on the x-axis, they plotted a bunch of cars based on their power to weight ratio. And on the y-axis, they plotted cars based on their power to wheelbase ratio. And when they took a look at this, they used a Formula One car as the ultimate example of what was achievable, a car way down in the corner that no road car could really ever get close to. When they plotted all these cars, they realized that they followed a kind of curve that, well, looked like the Milky Way full of lots of stars. And they wanted to build a car that was way outside the realm of normality. They wanted to build a car that was closer to the ideal Formula one car ratio of power to weight. And so they set out to accomplish that goal with the NSX. For their overall design of the car though, Honda first went to Pininfarina, the same company that designed Ferraris at that time, because they wanted them to style something to look modern and futuristic. And the result was the HPX, or the Honda Pininfarina Experimental. That was the car they came up with. And frankly, it looks very different to this one, but that was the beginning of Honda's approach to making something outside of the norm. They'd eventually develop this car themselves, the NSX, or New Supercar Experimental. But the X in this case was actually used more as a reference to X as in, as in unknown, an unknown variable. And that's what Honda was trying to achieve. They were doing something they had never done before by building a supercar, and so it made sense that X would end up in the name for the unknown. And now it's time to get nerdy and talk about the design of the NSX, and we're going to start by talking about its aluminum monocoque construction. Now let's break that down a little bit. First, why use aluminum? Aluminum has a lot of benefits. Its number one benefit being that it's lightweight, and that was the main focus with this car. Honda wanted it to have as low a curb weight as they could possibly achieve, but still have modern amenities like a stereo and air conditioning. And so aluminum was the material they wanted to use. It also has the benefit of being fully recyclable and it's resistant to corrosion, which is great. However, it is very expensive to develop the tooling to build it, especially when most of the cars that you make are made of steel. So it was a huge commitment that Honda made to make this car out of aluminum. So what is a monocoque structure? Well, the idea is that with a monocoque, the body is the only structural element of the car. There are no additional subframes or anything like that. It's all built into one singular member. The benefit of this is that it's relatively simple, but it's also lightweight as you don't have additional subframes on the car. 
Now, this car has some traditional strengthening throughout it, which makes it a semi-monocoque as opposed to a full monocoque. But regardless, it meant that this car was strong and lightweight. When you couple that with the aluminum that it was made out of, it was even lighter. And the result is that this car, the early versions of this car, weighed close to 3,000 pounds. And this one specifically weighs a little bit closer to 3,200 pounds. Extremely lightweight, especially by modern day standards. And we can't discuss the design of the NSX without talking about its refinement process because it involved my favorite racing driver of all time, Ayrton Senna. Because Honda was the engine supplier for McLaren, they had access to Senna, who drove the early NSX prototype, and he famously criticized it for being too fragile and not stiff enough. And so Honda went to the racetrack to make it stiffer. They worked with other racing drivers at the Nürburgring, applying patches and reinforcing parts manually in order to make the car stiffer. They would then send this information back to Japan, where it would be put into a supercomputer that would find lightweight solutions in order to make the car stiffer. And the result of all of this work is that the car's body did not weigh more than the NA Miata of the time, which was incredibly light, but it was 50% stiffer than the early prototype NSXs. And so Honda was able to achieve the ultimate stiffness they were looking for while not increasing the weight all that much. The last aspect of design I want to talk about with the NSX has to do with its F-16 inspired canopy, and that's this large greenhouse area located here. The idea with this is the designers took inspiration from the F-16, which offered incredible visibility for fighter pilots, and they wanted to incorporate that into the car. And so this car has 316 degree visibility as you look around, which is phenomenal for a road car. It also doesn't interrupt the design of the car, and that was the focus of the F-16's canopy. It didn't interrupt the aerodynamics, but it allowed for excellent visibility, and that's exactly what you find here with the NSX. So what engine would be powering this ultra-exotic, technically-focused, F-16-inspired, Ayrton Senna-tested supercar? Would it be a V12 or maybe a turbocharged V8? No, it would be a 3-liter, naturally-aspirated, V6. Now Honda chose this original engine for a very specific reason and that has to do with packaging. They couldn't fit a bigger engine in here if they wanted to and so they chose a 90 degree V6 as the engine for the NSX. Now I've mentioned that it's a 90 degree V6 for a very specific reason and I've touched on this in other videos but 90 degrees is an unusual configuration for V6. It's more commonly found on V8s. And the reason is that a 90 degree V6 has harmonic imbalances, and so it tends to vibrate a little bit more, and that's one of the characteristics of this engine. But again, for packaging reasons, Honda had to go with a 90 degree design in order to fit this engine in the middle of the NSX. Packaging constraints were also one of the reasons why Honda couldn't fit a supercharger or a turbocharger to this engine, and you can see why. There's not a lot of excess room in here. But regardless, this engine still made excellent power, and that's because Honda chose to make it a very high revving engine, thanks to VTEC. Now, when this car was originally released, it didn't have VTEC, and the president of Honda at the time, who was a famed engine designer himself, wondered why this cutting-edge technology wasn't on their most cutting-edge sports car. And so, engineers went back to the drawing board and added VTEC, Honda's variable valve timing. They also added dual overhead cams, which is bragged about right here on the engine cover. But that's not what we have here. This is an NA2 NSX, and so this has the 3.2 liter V6, which produces 290 horsepower and 224 foot-pounds of torque. Even more impressive than this, though, would be the revs that this car can achieve. This car can rev to 8,300 RPM, which is just insane. And Honda made sure that the internals of this engine were reinforced, most notably by adding titanium connecting rods, a very exotic technique at that particular time. But all this design comes together when you put the rubber on the road and test this car, and Honda achieved their goal. This car could do 0 to 60 in 5.2 seconds, which at the time was a full half a second faster than the Ferrari 348. And this car was more reliable, less expensive, and it could outhandle that car as well. And so Honda achieved their design brief. They made a car that could beat Ferrari. But outright performance wasn't the only area where the NSX trounced the Ferrari. It was also in the handling department that it was a much better car. This car had a lot of lightweight aluminum suspension components in addition to its aluminum body, but it also critically had double wishbone front and rear suspension. 
Now, as I mentioned in a previous video, the benefit of double wishbone suspension means that you can control the car better through corners. It means that it handles more flatly, but you don't have to run very stiff shocks and springs. And so the result is you don't compromise the ride, but you get excellent handling. It also allows the engineers to play more with the setup than they would be able to normally with a standard McPherson strut setup. And so naturally in a car that's designed to handle extremely well, you find double wishbones front and rear for the NSX. And now we move inside the NSX to discuss its transmission. Now there are three transmission options that you could get with this car in its time. The first would be a five-speed manual transmission, which it was offered with initially. The second would be a four-speed automatic, a traditional torque converter automatic. And the third is what we have here, a six-speed manual transmission. Now there are a lot of benefits of this car having the six-speed manual transmission. Obviously three pedals in a sports car is what you want, so it's definitely better than the automatic, but it's actually better than the five speed manual as well, which is what the majority of NSXs are. The benefit is that this transmission does not suffer with the snap ring failure that's found on the very early five speed NSXs. We begin by talking about what a snap ring is. Basically, it's a piece of metal that holds the counter shaft in the transmission case and it prevents it from moving back and forth. This car doesn't have straight cut gears. So as a result, the gears have to move a little bit in order to mesh with one another. And this ring keeps that counter shaft from moving so it's not imbalanced. However, with some of these cars, the transmission casing was made too large. So the snap ring would move around, placing enormous force on either side of it. And eventually it would explode and send lots of small pieces of metal through the transmission. Obviously not a great thing to experience when you're driving a manual transmission car but that was rectified for the six-speed manual cars, and so this car doesn't suffer with the snap ring issue. The last thing I want to talk about on the inside of the NSX is that this is an NSX T model, so it has this lift-out Targa roof. Now, with the roof in, it retains the elegant long lines of this car, and it looks, well, incredibly beautiful. And with it removed, you get the thrills of top-down driving, and you can hear that naturally aspirated six-cylinder engine a little bit more clearly. Whichever configuration you choose to enjoy the NSX, it's nice that it has this versatility. And frankly, that was the whole focus of this car. It was supposed to be versatile. You can drive it every day or to work, or you can drive it on the racetrack and have a whole lot of fun. Okay, it's time to drive the NSX. This car feels so easy to drive. <laughs> wow, it feels so nice. Oh, and that shifter, so direct and just perfect. Oh, heel pull down shifting is lovely too. This is so good. <laughs> it's so good. It's not that fast, I will say. And we'll string it out here. We'll, we'll get after it a little bit more. Again, I don't want to push it too hard. It's not my car. The sheer amount of visibility is ridiculous. Ridiculous. You can see everything in this car and you can place it so well on the road. You just have a sense of exactly where the front of this car is. And I can, I can just, I can see, I can see everything. So that, that's great. That's a big difference to a lot of other exotic cars that I've driven. Next thing I want to discuss is the engine. So the engine in this car you know, it's not crazy powerful, 290 horsepower, which is not nothing, but it's also not insane. That's a pretty low by most standards of the, of the current time uh, power ratings. And honestly, even of its day, that's not a lot of power. Man, the induction noise is so good. It's so good in this car and the way it revs. It is funny that you know, because of its configuration, that 90 degree V6 at low speed, it really does have a little rock to it. But once that you get moving, yeah, it, it builds power very progressively. Just, it's just so linear, but you can hear when that VTEC cam like starts doing its thing. And yeah, it's great. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm really staying only in one gear because I'm in a very tight road at the moment. I'm kind of limited. I'm in, I'm on Mercer Island yet again uh, here in Seattle and uh, it's kind of tight. Um, so I, and I can't really go all that fast. But the things I've noticed the most about the chassis is that it's just like very compliant and like just really nice. It feels stiff enough to give you confidence, but the suspension isn't so stiff um, that it rattles your teeth out. It's, it's not like a modern car in that regard. That said, it allows you to just play with the car and you can just follow the corners around with the throttle and it just digs in and it just goes, which 
which is great. I can see why this car punches so far above its weight class in terms of power, um, and that's because it just can outhandle pretty much everything, you know, from its time. And that makes a lot of sense. That was its design purpose. So the chassis, utterly magnificent. The steering is a little slow. I will say you're, I'm having to shuffle it through some of these tighter corners, and that's just, you know, of its era. You know, a lot of cars were kind of had slow steering at this time, so it's, it's no surprise that I necessarily have to do that. Kind of par for the course with, with a car like this. Wow, it really zings up there. Oh, those downshifts, baby. Wow, and the confidence it gives you into these corners. Wow, it's great. And this car is mostly stock. That's, that's unbelievable that it's this good just right out of the box. It goes exactly where you want it to do. You can just hit every apex in it with effortless like precision. It's just, oh, this is really, really good. I'm so pleasantly surprised. This was a car that I was always kind of wondering, like how could it possibly live up to the lore that's around it? A perfect car it is not. Again, I wish it had more power, but boy, as a, as a, as a visceral experience to enjoy at kind of the same 7 tenths performance level I did with my F355, boy, it is something to think about. And that is the NSX. This is an incredibly special car that touts beautiful, exotic styling, mid-engine handling, excellent performance, a six-speed manual transmission, and it's reliable. And it certainly gives me something to ponder tonight over an old-fashioned. And if you've been in the market for an NSX, well, head to carsandbiz.com where you can check out our selection of this incredible sports car. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will talk to you very soon. Goodbye!